Hello, my name is Doug Jensen, and welcome to my master class on the Sony PXW FS7 camcorder. Over the next few hours, we're going to take a detailed look at the most important aspects of this revolutionary camcorder and get you up to speed shooting great video as quickly as possible. If you love the look of images that you can shoot with cinema style cameras and DSLRs, but want the ergonomics and professional features of a traditional Sony shoulder mount camcorder, then the FS7 was built for you. However, unless you've already had some experience with one of the FS7's cousins, the F55 or F5, this camera is probably going to seem very different from any camera that you've used in the past. And even if you do have experience with those other two cameras, you certainly don't want to be caught off guard by some critical differences that exist between them and the FS7. Despite its affordable price, the FS7 is a very serious and deceptively complex camera that would take anyone a lot of time to completely figure out. And that's why I produced this workshop, to help get fellow FS7 owner-operators like you started off on the right foot. This masterclass is aimed squarely at small production companies, broadcasters, freelancers, owner-operators, corporate users, and anyone else who wants to get great results with the FS7, but who might not have the time or maybe the necessary experience to quickly get up to speed all on their own. This video is not just an improved English translation of Sony's operation manual or a superficial camera review that was thrown together after I spent a few hours with a loaner camera. I actually purchased my own FS7 and most of the accessories and lenses that I'll be talking about. I've spent weeks testing, experimenting, evaluating, and kicking the tires of the FS7 so that I can share my findings with you. No matter what your professional background is, I'm confident that this video will help you get a handle on the FS7's codec options, high frame rate recording modes, S-Log gamma curves, Cine EI shooting modes, white balance quirks, exposure tools, MLUTs, paint menus, user menus, scene files, clip naming modes, and dozens of other features. I hope this workshop will help you get more out of the FS7 than you ever thought possible. So let's get moving because we've got an awful lot of ground to cover. First off, I need to point out that the information presented in this video is based on firmware version 1.1. However, by the time you're watching this video, your camera will probably be running a new and improved version of the firmware, and that may result in some slight differences between your camera's menu options and the ones you'll see me using today. Sony is well known for frequently releasing free firmware updates to improve the performance of their cameras and to add new features and functions, and I think that's great. But the downside is that it's impossible for me to update this video to keep pace with every little firmware change. In some cases, I can anticipate what firmware changes are likely to be made, so I'll point those out as we go along. But I'm sure there will be many more that I did not expect. So as we go along, please be on the lookout for differences between our cameras and adjust how you use your camera accordingly. Now, there are many things that make the FS7 superior to other cameras in this price range. Let's begin with the sensor. The FS7 Super 35mm sensor is the same one that's used on Sony's much more expensive PMW F5. There are many things that make these two cameras very different from one another, but at their core, they have the same sensor. Super 35 is the standard imager size for motion picture films and is enormous in comparison to most other HD camcorders. And what does that mean to you? Well, a larger sensor can help you get shallower depth of field, thus give you a range of creative options that isn't possible with cameras that have smaller sensors. But the FS7 Super 35mm sensor isn't just any ordinary high-definition sensor such as you'll find on a lot of other cameras. Why? Because the sensor on the FS7 is designed for shooting 4K video and is packed with more than four times as many photo sites. And what does that mean to you? Well, it means the FS7 can shoot stunning 4K video that has four times the resolution of normal 1080p high-definition. Unlike 3D, 4K is real, it's coming fast, and it will be here to stay. Personally, I'm already shooting about 80% of my stuff in 4K. Although there are other, less expensive cameras that can shoot 4K, the FS7 can do true 4096 by 2160 4K internally after an upcoming firmware update with no bulky external recorders, extra cables, or batteries. And to make things even better, the FS7 can do 4K using Sony's new XAVC codec that requires a fraction of the storage space and processing power in post that RAW formats or ProRes files require. And don't overlook the fact that the FS7 is a true professional style shoulder mount camcorder and not a DSLR masquerading as a video camera. Although the F55 can also record internal 4K, the FS7 has the advantages of better ergonomics out of the box, smaller size, lighter weight, and a significantly lower price point. 
In my opinion, the FS7 is probably the best bang for the buck of any camera in history. Now I could very easily go on and on listing all the highlights and specifications of the FS7, but why waste your valuable time doing that? This video is not meant to be a new product review, nor is it a shopping guide or a camera shootout. The purpose of this video is to help you set up, understand, and operate the FS7. So what I want to do next is take a quick tour around the whole camera to get familiar with the external buttons and controls, and then we'll take a more detailed look at all of them in later chapters. Now because the PXW FS7 is not an entry level camera, I'm going to proceed with the assumption that you already have some experience under your belt shooting video professionally and have at least a basic understanding of the general principles of television and film production. You won't find any filler in this training video on general topics that would apply to all cameras such as depth of field, composition, lighting, and so forth. In this workshop, we want to stay focused as much as possible on the features and functions that you need to know in order to get great results with the FS7. The layout of the camera's controls are by far the best I've seen on any large sensor camcorder. If you're coming from an ENG shoulder mount camcorder background, then you'll instantly feel at home because all of the switches and knobs are logically laid out right where you'd expect them to be. Probably the most unusual feature of the FS7 is the smart grip, so let's begin there. This is the fourth Super 35mm Sony camcorder that I've owned, and it's the first one that was ready to go for handheld shooting right out of the box. In fact, I think handheld shooting must have been at the forefront of the designer's minds. The camera simply feels pretty good on the shoulder, and a lot of the credit for that goes to the smart grip. But the smart grip is much more than just a bolt-on accessory for making handheld shooting feel more comfortable. It's actually an integral part of the camera's design, and offers several other important functions that make shooting easier. First, we find a button with a 5 printed on it and the words User Menu stenciled next to it. The number 5 tells us that this is assigned button number 5, and the label User Menu indicates the default function of the button. Assigned buttons are a standard Sony camcorder feature that have been around for several years, so you probably understand their purpose. But just in case you're not familiar with them, let me explain anyway. Basically, the FS7 has six assign buttons, and each one of them can be customized to instantly activate any one of 34 functions that you get to choose. That way you can easily turn your most frequently used settings on or off at the touch of a button without having to scroll through layers of menus. Some of the functions that can be given to an assign button include things like turning steady shot on and off, inserting invisible shot mark metadata into a clip, and activating the camera's picture cache function. In the case of assign button number 5, it's pre-programmed to activate the camera's user menu function. Of course, you can either leave it programmed for that function, or as we'll see in a later chapter, change it to something else that you might prefer instead. So that brings up the logical question, what the heck is a user menu? Well, we'll cover user menus in detail later in chapter 4, so I don't want to get sidetracked now. But in a nutshell, a user menu is a special customizable section of the camera's menu system that allows you to build your own custom menu page from scratch. So you can have up to 20 of your most frequently used menus located in one central location and sorted in any order you want. It can be a huge time saver. So when you press assign button number 5, you'll jump straight to the top of the user menu page. And then you can use the multi-selector, just above assign button number 5, like a joystick to navigate through the camera's menu system and also through the thumbnail images during playback. And when you want to make a selection, you just press in on the center of the multi-selector. Notice that even though assign button number 5 initially takes you to the top of the user menu as the starting point, you'll still have full access to all of the camera's menus once you're inside. So really, you can look at assign button number 5 as just being a very convenient way of changing any menu on the camera during handheld shooting. Just above the multi-selector, you'll find a record start-stop button. This is probably the most important button on the grip because it makes starting and stopping recording during handheld shooting so easy. On top of the grip, you'll find a zoom rocker switch for use with compatible lenses. But when you don't have a compatible lens mounted on the camera, this switch doesn't do anything at all. Next to the zoom control, we find a sign button number 4 with the words focus mag stenciled next to it. So as we learned with the sign button number 5, that means focus magnification is the button's default function. But since it's an assign button, you've got the option of reprogramming it for any of the other 34 allowed functions. Pressing this button once will electronically magnify the center of the image in the viewfinder by 400%, thus making it easier to check the focus. Pressing it a second time will magnify the image 800%. 
and pressing it a third time will return the viewfinder to normal. Now, Focus Mag works with all lenses and all shooting modes. In fact, you can even use Focus Magnification while you're recording because it's purely a monitoring function and it doesn't affect the image that's being recorded internally or what is being output by any of the video connectors. Unlike some cameras, you cannot change the part of the frame that is magnified. Swinging around to the front of the Smart Grip, we find the assignable dial, which by default can be used to change the iris of a compatible lens. But as you may have guessed from its name, the assignable dial can be reprogrammed for something else instead, such as changing the gain, focusing a compatible lens, or adjusting the audio recording levels. And the final control on the grip, hidden discreetly away on the inside, is assign button number 6. Notice that this assign button doesn't have a label next to it, so what does that tell us? Right, it doesn't have a default function. But you can choose from the 34 different options if you want to give it a function. I normally have a Sign 6 on my camera programmed to turn steady shot on and off. And since the Smart Grip uses the industry standard length protocol, it's possible to use other third party length devices if you choose to. Now, after the Smart Grip, the next most prominent feature on the FS7 is the LCD monitor. Just as they did with the EX3, the FS100, and the PMW300 cameras, Sony has designed an optical eyepiece that attaches over the top of the LCD panel to turn it into a very nice viewfinder thus totally eliminating the need to spend hundreds or even thousands of dollars on a third-party viewfinder. So with the FS7, you get the best of both worlds, an excellent viewfinder that magnifies the image, blocks out ambient light, and provides a solid point of contact for handheld shooting. And then, at any time, you can release the catch, flip up the extension tube out of the way, and view the 3.5-inch LCD monitor directly. And don't forget to take a few seconds to adjust the optics of the eyepiece by turning the diopter ring so that the image in the viewfinder precisely matches your own unique eyesight. If flipping the eyepiece up out of the way isn't good enough, then you can release the latches on the top and bottom and just remove it entirely from the camera. Along the left side, you'll find a contrast control knob, an on-off button for peaking, and an on-off button for zebra. Peaking is a feature for helping you focus the camera manually by emphasizing areas of the picture that are in sharp focus, while Zebra is a feature that helps you set the exposure. These are two of the most important controls on the camera, so we'll be talking a lot more about both of them later. Now underneath the viewfinder, you'll find a mirror switch for inverting and or flipping the image that is shown in the viewfinder. But of course, this doesn't affect what's actually being recorded. It's a handy feature to have for unusual shooting situations where you might have the viewfinder facing forward or even upside down. As you can see, the viewfinder is mounted on a rod, which in turn is attached to another rod that slides into the camera's handle. I really like this design because it allows an almost infinite number of ways to set up the camera. Not only for handheld comfort, but also for making the camera as compact as possible or for putting the viewfinder at the rear of the camera for tripod shooting. If you find that the supplied rods are too short to position the viewfinder exactly where you want it, you can swap them out with any industry standard 15mm rods. Now one thing to be aware of with this design though is that it's really easy for the viewfinder to become slanted to one side and inadvertently cause you to shoot everything a little crooked. You wouldn't think that a 1 or 2 degree slope would make a big difference, but as you'll see when it happens to you, it does. So you need to be constantly on guard to prevent the viewfinder from becoming unlevel or you'll get tricked into shooting everything sloped. Fortunately, the camera offers a handy electronic level indicator in the viewfinder to assist you. A great feature of the FS7, and maybe one of the big reasons you bought it, is the ability to change lenses so you can choose the precise type of lens that best suits your subject, shooting style, and budget. As you probably know, the FS7 can be purchased as a body-only model or as a bundled package that includes this 28mm to 135mm 4.8x zoom lens. It features servo zoom control, optical steady shot, a constant f4 aperture, autofocus, auto iris, and excellent image quality. To remove a lens from the camera, you just press the lens release button all the way in, rotate the lens counterclockwise until it stops, and then pull it off. The native lens mount of the FS7 is called the Sony E-mount, and it's the same mount that is used on Sony's FS100, FS700, A7S, and other cameras in the NEX product line. A big advantage of Sony's E-mount is that it has a very short 18mm flange focal depth, and that makes it really easy to mount almost any 35mm lens you can lay your hands on, provided you've got the right adapter. 
Adapters are available for Canon EF, Nikon, PL, Leica, Sony Alpha, and many other types of lenses. And since most adapters merely serve as a mechanical dock and don't have any glass in them, they won't cause any loss of light or diminished optical performance. Just below the lens, on the front of the camera body, there's a white balance set button, located right where you'd expect it to be on a pro camera. Up here, there's the main record start stop button, which unfortunately doesn't have a built-in tally light. Next, we find an essential component of any professional camcorder, and that is the ND filter knob. Clear, as the name implies, is a clear filter that allows maximum light transmission. The quarter ND filter reduces the amount of light entering the camera by two stops. The 1 16th filter reduces the amount of light entering the camera by four stops, and the 1 64th filter reduces the amount of light entering the camera by six stops. As you'd expect, these are real optical ND filters and not just electronic gimmicks to change the gain. Also, since they're truly color neutral, meaning they'll have no effect at all on color balance, they can be used indoors or outdoors. Now over in this area of the camera, we find assigned buttons number one, number two, and number three. Each of them has been labeled with their default setting. Button number one is assigned to let you quickly turn slow and quick motion on or off so you don't have to go digging into the menus. In case you don't know already, SNQ motion is Sony's terminology for overcranking and undercranking the frame rate. The camera can shoot from one frame per second up to 180 frames per second internally. And if you add an optional external raw recorder, you can stretch it out to 240 frames per second. Next, button number two is programmed to turn the auto iris function on or off. But of course, you must be using a compatible lens that allows iris control. And even then, auto iris only functions when the camera is in certain configurations. One method of activating auto iris momentarily is to use the push auto iris button. In some shooting configurations, when the camera is set for manual iris control, you can press this button and hold it down while the camera adjusts the exposure automatically, and then release the button to return back to manual control. Next, there's an unlabeled thumb wheel called the iris style, and that allows you to control the aperture of certain types of lenses that don't have a physical aperture ring on the lens itself. For example, this Sony 18-105 E-mount lens doesn't have an iris ring, so the only way to set the aperture manually is by turning the dial. Now obviously if you're using a lens that does have a physical iris ring, such as this Sony 28-135 E-mount lens, then the aperture is controlled by turning the iris ring on the lens itself. As I noted a minute ago, the iris dial doesn't have a label, and the reason for that is because it can be programmed to do other functions instead, if you don't need it to control the iris. The hold switch can be used to disable almost every button on the camera, thus preventing unintended changes from being made. You can use this menu to decide whether or not the record button on the side of the camera and the buttons on the smart grip are also locked out. By default, they are. Next, we come to the status button, which makes it really easy to check information about the camera's current configuration without having to drill down into the menu system to look at individual menus. The eight status pages are a big time saver, and they're something you should get in the habit of using often. Unfortunately, none of the settings can be changed from the status pages. All you can do is look at them. The first status page is called Camera. You can see information about the current settings of the ISO gain switch, shutter speed, f-stop, zebra, gamma, white balance, and so forth. I won't waste time describing each of these displays individually, because most of them should be self-explanatory. To change to the next status page, you just roll the select set dial down. Status page 2 shows all of the most important audio related settings, including audio meters that are several times larger than the default audio meters. Whenever you're setting critical audio levels, these are the meters that you'll want to be looking at for maximum precision. Page 3 is the system status page. Here you can see the current recording format, the picture size, the frame rate, and several other video settings. Some of these require extensive explanations, so we'll hold off and talk about them later when we get to those chapters. Page 4 shows the various settings for the video output connectors. Page 5 shows the current function of the six assign buttons, plus the programmable iris dial on the side of the camera and the assignable dial on the front of the smart grip. Next, page 6 shows us important information about the battery. You can see the remaining capacity, how many times it's been recharged, and other information. Page 7 tells us what's going on with the two XQD memory cards and the SD card if we've got one on board. 
In this case, you can see that I only have a card in slot A and slot B is empty. The estimated remaining time is based on the camera's currently selected format settings. And finally, this status screen indicates how the camera's simultaneous recording mode is configured. Not only is the FS7 the first XD cam to allow recording onto two memory cards at once, it goes one step further by allowing you to customize how it functions. For example, you could configure the camera so that pressing the record button on the side of the camera starts and stops recording on card A, but pressing the record button on the handle starts and stops recording on card B. Now pressing the status button again clears the status display completely from the screen. Moving back over here, assign button number three functions exactly like button number five on the grip to give you quick access to the custom user menu. And like I said before, it's really a gateway to all of the other camera menus as well. The focus auto manual switch does just what the name implies, but of course, auto requires the use of a compatible lens. Likewise, the push auto focus button will allow you to momentarily activate auto focus whenever the switch next to it is in the manual position and when you've got a compatible lens. You know, I'm getting tired of continually pointing out that certain functions require the use of a compatible lens, and you're probably tired of hearing it. So I'm going to stop saying it over and over again. So when I talk about auto iris, auto focus, servo zoom, etc., you should just assume that a compatible lens is required. Now down here, we find a display button that allows you to instantly hide all of the on-screen displays that are shown in the viewfinder or on an external monitor connected to SDI output number two. As we'll see in Chapter 5, you can use the camera's menu options to pick and choose which of the various on-screen displays that you want to have visible while you're shooting. But this button is handy when you want to clear the screen of all that clutter, especially during playback. Next, we find the Full Auto button that provides an easy way to instantly change many of the camera settings to automatic. Those settings are Aperture, Gain, Shutter Speed, and White Balance. But please note that other camera functions, such as focus and audio levels, are not affected by this button. Also, it's interesting to note that Full Auto is the only button on the camera with its own internal LED light to remind you when it's on. Just above the Full Auto button, you'll find the same type of three position gain switch that you'd find on any professional camera. Whenever gain is set for manual control, the gain switch allows you to easily change how much gain is being applied to the video signal. The default values are 0 dB for L, plus 6 dB for M, and plus 12 dB for H. But each of those settings can be reprogrammed if you'd prefer something else instead. The allowable values range from minus 3 up to plus 18. The FS7 also gives you the option of displaying the camera sensitivity as an ISO number rather than gain if you prefer that nomenclature. So be aware as we go forward that pretty much any time I talk about gain, the information I'm giving you also applies to the ISO mode unless I say differently. Now there are some important differences between the two modes, but we'll wait and talk about that topic later. Just above the gain switch is a button labeled ISO Gain that allows you to toggle back and forth between manual gain control and automatic gain control. There's no indicator light on the button, so the only way you can be sure what gain mode you're using at any given time is to look at the viewfinder display. AGC stands for Automatic Gain Control. The next button works the same way except for white balance. If ATW is shown in the viewfinder, then automatic white balance is being used. If ATW is not shown, then the manual mode is being used. Whenever the white balance is not set for automatic, this switch is what controls the camera's white balance. As with any other professional camcorder, you've got the choice of using memory B, memory A, or preset. The default value of the preset position is 3200K, which is a typical value you might use for indoor shooting under incandescent lighting. However, later I'll show you how you can change the preset to 6000K for daylight shooting or any other value that you want from 1500K up to 50,000K. Next, we have the shutter button. But don't make the mistake of thinking this is just a simple on-off switch for automatic shutter the way that gain and white balance switches work for those functions. If you make that mistake, you could be in for big trouble by accidentally shooting with shutter speeds that you didn't intend. 
Now it's a little complicated to explain how this button affects the shutter speed, and I don't want to waste your time doing it twice. So let's hold off and discuss it in more detail during chapter 10 in context with the other exposure controls. But in the meantime, be careful how you set the shutter speed and pay close attention to the number that is shown in the viewfinder. Always verify that the speed shown is what you really want to use. In this area, we find some of the camera's audio recording controls. The FS7 has independent controls for both audio channels, which are recorded as high quality, 24 bit, 48 kilohertz uncompressed audio for excellent quality and fidelity. This pair of audio select switches allows you to decide whether the audio recording levels will be controlled automatically or manually. If you choose manual, then the recording levels can be adjusted with the rotary audio recording level knobs located right next to them. The slot select button allows you to designate which of the two XQD cards you're recording onto at any given time, unless of course you're using the camera's simultaneous recording mode to record to both cards at once. It's good to know that with most of the recording formats, if one card fills up during recording, the camera will automatically switch to the other card without missing a single frame. That's called relay recording. In fact, you can even hot swap cards without interrupting the recording, so in theory you could record non-stop forever. And anytime you want to play back clips that are stored on the memory cards, all you've got to do is press the thumbnail button. And the playback mode is ready to go almost instantly. You can navigate through the clips to view metadata about each one, or select a clip to begin playback. But hold on, it gets better. What if something suddenly happens while you're playing back a clip and you need to start shooting again right away? With some cameras, you'd have to stop playback, push a button to exit the playback mode, and then wait a few seconds for the camera to get back into the recording mode, but not with the FS7. With this camera, you can be in the middle of playing back a clip, hit the record button, and the camera will be rolling in about two seconds. To me, that is a huge advantage over other cameras. Now, even though they aren't labeled to identify their playback functions, all of the buttons in this area are used for playback control. Pressing the select set dial will pause playback and pressing it again resumes playback. Pressing the left or right buttons momentarily will cause playback to jump to the head of the previous or next clip. Pressing and holding either button will activate fast forward or fast reverse. Pressing the cancel back button stops playback and returns the camera to the normal standby mode. And that brings us to the all important menu button that is used to access the camera's vast menu system and also the select set jog dial that allows you to scroll through the menu pages and make changes. You spin the dial to highlight the setting you want and then make a selection by pressing in on it. The cancel button allows you to undo menu changes or to jump back one level in the menu hierarchy. The camera's two XQD memory card slots are hidden under this cover, which is opened by pressing this button. The slots are known as A and B. Currently, XQD cards are available in capacities that range from 16 gigabytes to 128 gigabytes. There's also a slot for an SD card, but you can't record video on an SD card. They're only used for saving and loading scene files, all files, lens files, custom MLUTs, and other types of files that are collectively referred to as user data. We'll learn more about their use as we go along. Located just below the SD card slot is a USB 2.0 port that makes it possible to connect the camera directly to a computer and ingest your clips when a standalone XQD card reader isn't available, but I recommend you save this for emergency use only. Just above the SD card slot we find the camera's headphone jack. Unfortunately, there's no external volume control knob for headphone output, so you have to drill down into the audio menus anytime you want to change the level. And there's also a companion menu in the same area that determines which of the two audio channels you're monitoring and how they're mixed. If you don't have headphones connected, then audio during playback is output from this tiny little speaker right here. Moving to the rear of the camera, we find the rear tally light, which can be disabled using one of the system menus if you don't want it to light up during recording. Unfortunately, a single menu setting controls both the front and rear tally lights, so if you want one of them, then you've got to have them both. Under this plastic cover, you'll find a multi-pin connector for attaching an optional extension unit called the XDCA-FS7, or simply XDCA for short. When it's attached, the XDCA essentially becomes part of the camera. The extension unit costs about $2,000, but it greatly expands the capabilities of the camera in several ways. First, it adds in-out connectors for timecode, a reference signal, 
Genlock, 12 volt power, and raw output for recording to an external recorder, such as Sony's R5 recorder or Convergent Design's 7Q+. Second, after a future firmware update, it will enable the camera to record ProRes files onto the internal XQD cards. Third, it changes the ergonomics of the camera by pushing the center of gravity towards the rear, thus providing better balance for handheld shooting. And fourth, it allows you to use industry standard camera batteries, such as this Anton Bauer Digital 90 V-mount battery seen here. The new Anton Bauer Digital batteries are available in three sizes, 90 watt hours, 150 watt hours, and 190 watt hours. And even the smallest one can power my FS7 for over four hours. I use these Anton Bauer batteries to power just about all of my gear, the camera, my light panel's LED lights, and even my 17-inch Sony OLED monitor. Since almost nothing gets plugged into the wall anymore on most of my shoots, having reliable, cost-effective batteries is extremely important to me. Although the FS7 doesn't have a DTAP outlet for powering accessories, such as an onboard light, the Anton Bauer batteries do, thus providing one more advantage over other batteries. Unlike most third-party batteries, the Anton Bowers communicate with the FS7 just like Sony batteries, so the remaining runtime shown in the viewfinder is given as minutes, not voltage, and other information can be seen on the battery status page. Normally, I shoot with the XDCA mounted on my camera, but I'll remove it for the remainder of this chapter. To power the camera from an external source, you can use the DC in connector located under this cover. Normally, you'll use this connector to get power from the supplied BCU1 AC adapter, which also does double duty as the battery charger. However, because the camera runs on standard 12 volt power, you can run the camera from practically any professional 12 volt battery or power supply that you may already own, but you'll need an adapter cable, which Sony doesn't make, however, Vortex Media does. The EXDC1 power cable allows you to easily power your camera from any professional 12 volt power source that has an XLR connector. The 6 foot cable has a standard 4 pin XLR connector at one end and Sony's special plug at the other end. Speaking of batteries, next we have the battery slot. Sony offers four batteries that are designed to fit the FS7 perfectly. These are the exact same batteries that the EX1R, EX3, PMW200, X180, and F3 cameras use. The battery release button is located right here. Just press it in, slide the battery up, and then pull it out. Over here, we find the sensor for receiving signals from the supplied infrared remote control. Right next to the sensor, almost invisible to the naked eye, is a tiny little internal microphone. As you've probably noticed, the FS7 doesn't come bundled with a shotgun microphone, but the internal mic is better than nothing for capturing scratch audio. And by scratch audio, I mean audio that can help with logging or editing, but isn't intended to actually be used in a final production. Down here, arranged vertically, we find SDI Out 1, SDI Out 2, and a single HDMI Out connector. Both SDI outputs are 422 10-bit. SDI-1 can be counted on to always provide a clean video signal with nothing superimposed. But SDI-2 and the HDMI connectors can be programmed to overlay viewfinder data, markers, and other information if you'd like. The jack-labeled remote is where you connect the cable from the smart grip. And the jack-labeled VF is where you connect the FS7's viewfinder cable. As with any professional camcorder, the FS7 comes equipped with two XLR jacks for attaching external microphones, a sound mixer, or any other pro audio equipment. These input selection switches can be used to choose line level, mic level, or 48 volt phantom power independently for each of the two inputs. Phantom power is a special way of powering certain types of microphones from the camera rather than from the microphone's own internal batteries. If you connect a microphone and you don't hear anything, chances are it needs phantom power turned on. Now I own a number of different shotgun microphones from several manufacturers that I could use on the FS7, but the two I think work best are Sony's ECM680 and ECM MS2. I like the MS2 a lot because it's small, lightweight, and delivers excellent stereo sound without breaking the bank. The metal body reduces vibration and shields it from interference, and the short length prevents it from creeping into the corners of my shots. It's really a very nice little mic for recording that sound that is more than good enough to use in a final edit. However, I switch over to the ECM680 when I want to record voices while shooting handheld in close, such as with news or documentaries. 
The 680 feels solid and well balanced on the FS7, and you're not going to find anything in this price range that can beat the sound quality. Both the 680 and MS2 are stereo microphones, so that's yet another bonus they offer if that's important to you. Under this cover, you'll find a special USB port where you can install the IFU WLM3 USB wireless LAN module that came with your FS7. Boy, that's a mouthful. Once installed and set up, the module allows you to view and change many of the camera's controls and settings via Wi-Fi from a smartphone, tablet, or computer. You won't be able to stream video or see any images from the camera, but that's about the only limitation. I was skeptical about it at first, but I've become a convert and I believe this is a pretty cool feature to have on any camera. And just to avoid any confusion about what the LAN connector can do, I should point out that there's also an optional wireless adapter called the CBK-WA100, and that adapter can stream video, record proxy files, and do a number of things that the WLM3 cannot do. Moving to the top of the camera, we find the shotgun microphone mount and a nether record button. You can rotate the hold switch to prevent the button from accidentally being pushed. Next, we have a zoom rocker switch that can be customized with the menus. In the default mode, the zoom speed is variable, meaning that the harder you press, the faster the focal length changes. And this is a welcome change from the fixed speed zooms on Sony's other cameras, but you're still going to find it challenging to get smooth starts and stops to your zooms. At the rear of the handle, there's a quarter 20 threaded hole for mounting accessories. But if you'd prefer to have a cold shoe instead, your camera came with the necessary hardware to make the change. See page 8 of Sony's operation manual for instructions on how to install it. At the other end of the handle, there's already an accessory shoe, but it's no ordinary shoe. This is called a multi-interface shoe. What makes it so special is that it offers two-way communication with the camera. For example, smart devices such as Sony's UWP-D11 wireless microphone receiver can pass audio to the camera and get power from the camera without any wires, extra batteries, or cables. The microphone system literally becomes part of the camera rather than a cumbersome attached accessory. Fortunately, the convenience of the D11 system doesn't come at the expense of sound quality or build quality. The transmitter and the receiver feature all-metal construction, easy-to-read LCD displays, USB power and charging, automatic channel scanning, infrared synchronization between the transmitter and receiver, mic line switchable input on the transmitter, and true diversity with PLL synthesized tuning that virtually eliminates interference. Now, before we wrap up this chapter, let's go back for a few minutes and talk about handheld shooting with the FS7. The grips on broadcast E and G lenses have been an integral part of their design for decades, and it's great to finally have a big sensor camera that offers that functionality right out of the box without buying a $35,000 lens. You may choose to have the smart grip raised up high, close to the lens, as I do for better leverage, or you may prefer to keep it down at chest level. The nice thing about the FS7 is that the choice is yours, and you can change your mind anytime you want. You can even remove it entirely if you're not going to be shooting handheld. I normally don't have mine attached, but when I do need it, it screws right into the rosette in about 15 seconds or less. By pressing the release button on the grip, you can quickly choose from 15 different angle settings to suit just about any shooting configuration you can imagine. And if you use a screwdriver on these two screws, you can lengthen or shorten the extension arm to further customize the fit. The unique design of the FS7 puts the weight on your shoulder and gives you four points of contact for stability. One, your right hand on the grip. Two, the camera body on your shoulder. Three, the camera body resting against the side of your head. And four, your eye up against the viewfinder diopter. And that leaves your left hand totally free to adjust the focus, the iris, and many other camera controls while you're shooting. Or you can use your hand to provide a fifth point of support. Personally, I find the stock FS7 to be pretty comfortable for handheld shooting as long as I'm using a small, lightweight lens such as this one. But when I use my bigger, heavier PL lenses, that's where the FS7 needs some help. Old beta cams and even newer cameras such as Sony's F800 have cushy built-in shoulder pads and their heavy recorders and batteries on the back end provide counterbalance. But with a small, lightweight camera such as the FS7, when using a heavy PL lens, the balance point is approximately where the lens meets the camera body, thus making the built-in shoulder pad almost useless. For example, this Zeiss 15.5-45 zoom is my go-to lens for handheld shooting. 
but it weighs about as much as the camera itself and throws the balance completely off. Having this much weight out in front with practically nothing behind me might be okay for a few minutes, but I can't shoot that way comfortably for an extended period of time. Another problem is that big lenses such as this red 300mm need support. I don't think the E-mount collar on the camera is designed to take this much weight and it can result in too much flexing at the lens mount. And if you're using a heavy lens for handheld shooting, then the problem of stability is even more pronounced. Now I don't think there's much danger that the mount will actually break off, but even a little play in the connection can cause back focus problems and other issues. And how can I mount a map box without having rods? Fortunately, I solved all of these issues by adding a Zacuto VCT universal base plate and a Zacuto rosette mini mount to my camera. Together, they offer many advantages, including being able to slide the camera backward or forward to achieve the perfect balance no matter what size lens I'm using or other accessories that I have mounted to the camera. I now have proper support for the heaviest lenses I'll probably ever use, not to mention the ability to mount a map box without clamping it to the lens. I can go instantly from tripod to handheld without reconfiguring anything on the camera at all. I should note, however, that the VCT version of Zacuto's universal base plate does not include the necessary quick release plate that attaches to the tripod head. There's also a version of the base plate that uses a standard tripod adapter, but I recommend the VCT model for rock solid stability. The Zacuto base plate also gives me a bigger, softer shoulder pad that feels fantastic and allows me to shoot handheld all day long with no fatigue. And finally, the Rosette Mini Mount gives me maximum flexibility to reposition the camera's smart grip to any position I want. So that concludes our basic overview of the camera, and you should now have a pretty good understanding of the major features of the PXW FS7, plus a general sense of where the important buttons and controls are located. But what I haven't done is give you very much detail, and that's what's coming up in the next two dozen chapters.